record this as well. So, all right, everyone, thank you for being here. Lisa, I really appreciate you being here. This is um, fantastic. I am thrilled, thrilled to have you. Uh, and uh, so for those of you who are listening in, participating, please feel free to ask questions over in the chat section. I will relay them on to Lisa. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody gets their chance to, uh, to ask what she's got going on, because I think there's a lot of fascinating things. Um, in fact, so many fascinating things that I don't know that I want to spend tons of time on your background, but I do think it's important to kind of know where you came from, and you came from an area near and dear to my heart. Um, you were a playwright before you got into wine, and I did and have done a bit of playwriting myself. Um, can you yeah. give a short version of how that led to wine? Because it doesn't come naturally. <laughs> well, no, playwriting, okay. I, I, I did a degree in, um, well, a, a double major in English literature and performing arts um, at Colby in Maine. And uh, I spent my junior year abroad in London studying, studying theater, but mainly Shakespeare um, and just fell in love with London. I mean, honestly, I was, I, I had grown up in the sticks of Maine and, you know, I'd never seen anything like it. I'd, I'd never even um, <laughs> been out of the country and, and uh, going to London was just like, wow. Um, and I knew that I wanted to go back and live. So as soon as I finished my degree, literally the day uh, that I got my degree, I got on a plane for London and I wound up living there for 13 years. Um, uh, but I just, uh, uh, as I was in London, I started discovering wine. I mean, really, I, I'd never been exposed to wine before that. And, and the one you know, great thing about London is it is such a hub for the wine world. You get so many great wines. I mean, obviously now, it, back in those days, these were in the, the late 80s, early 90s, they didn't um, even really make wine. I kept, you know, yeah. going by the, the chalk, chalky hills there, you know, um, looking and going, wow, that looks like champagne. Um, but uh, it, it's only recent that they started making wine. So they've always been a great importer and promoter of wines from all over the world. And I really discovered it there. Um, but uh, I, I, you know, uh, started writing plays and got a few performed on the fringe and and um, then uh, realized that playwriting didn't pay very much money. Yeah. So uh, went and got a job um, at a, a friend's, uh, oh, a friend of mine was managing a wine bar in, in Pimlico in London. And uh, I uh, got a job working there, just pouring, opening bottles and pouring, um, not knowing anything about wine, I hastened to add at that stage. And um, uh, eventually my friend was leaving the job and um, I was offered the position of manager. Um, I, I, this is where my acting skills came in. <laughs> I completely convinced the owners that I knew something about wine. Um, and then I had to, uh, once I got the job, I had to sort of like <laughs> uh, really, you know, show them that I did know something about wine. So I signed up for WSET classes and then eventually um, uh, wound up, you know, going all the way to diploma level um, with that. And then uh, signing up for the master of wine. And uh, in the meantime, I did just about every job in, in the UK. Um, after I, I finished uh, managing the wine bar, I did sales, marketing, purchasing, um, and then eventually moved to Tokyo um, and uh, was a wine buyer for a fine wine importer there. I also did some wine education there for the uh, Academy de Vin Wine School in Aoyama. And uh, then in 2008, I moved to Singapore. Real quick, do you, do you think having that diverse a background? I mean, I've always found I'd worked in restaurant, wholesale, retail. I found it helpful in a lot of ways to understand that, kind of what yeah. people are looking for. Absolutely, absolutely. Because in everything that you do, if you're working in the wine industry, you have to think like a consumer. You have to understand the consumer's position. And, uh, you know, of course, I'm a consumer as well. But, you know, my, my, you know, view can be blinkered according to what me, a wine geek, wants. So understanding the broad range of consumers out there, you know, at every different price point, wanting every different style, it's, it's absolutely important um, and, and, you know, vital to what I'm doing now when I describe wines for people um, so that it, the descriptions are meaningful, so that they'll understand the experience it's going to get from that wine. 
and also understanding uh, what what people are looking for, what's interesting to people. You know, one of the things that that I've learned, you know, even at Robert Parker Wine Advocate, where we had um, a larger team than we have at the the Wine Independent now, but you know, you can't taste everything, you can't write about everything. You have to choose, and you have to, you know, think like a consumer. What do consumers want to read about? What's important to them? Um, and you, you're talking to a subset of con consumers who are engaged enough at least to want to um, subscribe to a wine publication, which is not for everybody. Um, but that's not to say that they're so elitist that all they want to read about is Screaming Eagle and Harlan Estate and Shadow Latour and DRC. That's, that's absolutely not true. They want new discoveries as well at, at all levels and of all styles. Um, and it's it's homing in on on what those discoveries are and, and focusing on that. So yes, absolutely. My 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 training and you know uh, working for companies large and small. Um, you know I worked for LVMH for a while, um, doing um, sales and marketing of of mainly both Clico and Krug in London. Um, I've worked for very small companies. I've worked for um, uh, fine wine merchants, uh, Corny and Barrow in London. I worked for, uh, for about four years. Um, who have the agencies for Petrus and DRC and Romani and um, uh, Salon Champagne, for example. Um, so, you know, doing this broad set, but I also uh, worked for a little while for a company that, that um, uh, sold wines to big supermarket groups in the UK as well. Um, so, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, very small margins on, on, you know, million case deals of wines, you know, um, and, and, you know, looking for value basically yeah. um so understanding you know the broad set you know, it, it absolutely helped me you know, when i was doing my mw but it also helps me now to understand the the broad world of consumers and, and what people are interested in so you mentioned the, the mw there i mean that's quite the honor to have achieved that I, there are less than 400 still in the world today i believe and um that process to get that i, I guess Tell everybody a little bit about what it means. And then also, um, why did you decide to do it? Because it's an undertaking. This isn't a, oh, I'm just going to go try it and see how it turns out. It, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. Um, I, think, I think that, you know, um, when, I, when I went for the MW um, in the early 2000s, I started studying for the MW and I eventually got it in 2008. Um, I think I didn't understand exactly what a mammoth undertaking it was, what a journey it is. Um, but the academic side of it appealed to me and also the, the fact that it's, it is an industry qualification. Um, so those things interested me. And as I went on that journey, you realize really the, the depths of the wine world um, from the, you know, the practical side, the tasting side, because there's two, well, there's three parts to the exam really, but um, one part is the, the practical part, the blind tasting, which is um, uh, uh, conducted over three different days. So you get three different blind tasting papers of 12 wines each, um, and you're given two hours and 15 minutes to sit each of those paper. The first paper is white wine, the second paper is red wine, and the third paper is a mixed bag. It can be anything. It can be fortified, sweet, sparkling, um, or it can be red and white wines. Again, you, you never know what you're going to get. Um, and then there's the theory side, which is um, equally rigorous. And that's over four days um, where you've got to sit, you know, uh, and, and discuss everything from viticulture, winemaking, the business of wine, and contemporary issues that our wine industry is facing. Um, and then you have a research paper. In my day, it was actually a dissertation, a 10,000 word dissertation. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's now more of a research paper um, these days. Um, so it is, it's, it's a, an enormous journey because um, what you're, you're doing is first of all, getting your head around the syllabus that you're given um, for each of those papers. And then, you know, uh, focusing on what you need to achieve in terms of information and knowledge to get there. And although the, the um, Institute of Masters of Wine is very supportive um, in helping you to um, acquire all of that information and uh, be very specific about what kind of standard you need to, to get to, to in order to pass the exam, um, a lot of it's, you know, you, you know, and that, that's, 
you know, both good and bad, because, you know, you have to be very disciplined um, to do it. And, uh, you know, uh, both with, with, you know, getting your, your tasting standard up to scratch, but also with your, your theory knowledge up to scratch. Has, has it changed over time? I mean, I just think about the days when I was in wine retail and, you know, we didn't even have like a Portuguese red section at the time, you know, from Portugal, yeah. Portugal, it was <laughs> port. That was it. Yeah, has, yeah, has, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Has that, so yes, yeah, it, it has. It has. It has. Um, it, in many ways, it's it's changed for the better, um, because we're. Um, I should say, I um, uh, I actually work on the examination committee. I'm a paper chair um, for the practical exam for the tasting exam. So I oversee one of the papers every year, both with the selection of the wines. Um, with it, my group of examiners, and then also um, oversee the examination. So I, I understand the, the process from the inside. Um, and uh, I think, you know, from our perspective, we are, I, I think, working towards making it um, uh, more easily understood exactly what we're looking for when people are um, answering the questions on the papers. Um, uh, I think that, you know, we, the amount of attention and rigor that we put into the uh, selection of the wines that we put on the exam to make sure that they're absolutely spot on representative of, you know, if we're asking about region, asking about vintage, whatever we're asking about, that they're representative of that. And oftentimes we're, we're constantly like knocking back wines going, no, that's not representative of, no, we need, you know, something that's going to be, you know, absolutely representative um, in order to make it fair for people yeah. you know because if, if you just wanted to screw it. somebody around you could pick a weird outlier exactly and, and and but what would be the point of that and, you know yeah. i kind of always said you know uh, although it's very important for um uh people in the industry to understand what a uh, sense of place is you know when you're looking at uh, i don't know a Barossa Shiraz, you know, great Barossa, Barossa Shiraz or Sonoma Pinot Noir from the Sonoma Coast or something, and to be able to recognize, you know, where that comes from, recognize, of course, the grape variety, recognize, but more and more so what we're focusing on is, is what something that's near and dear to my heart, quality, recognizing quality. And, you know, that that's beyond what the price point is, you know, or, or even what, you know, the, the designated Grand Cru level is. And just to be able to hone in on, you know, what are the factors of quality and what is this wine, you know, in, in relation to maybe a, a, a couple of other wines that we're showing with it, you know, which one is the higher quality wine and why? Um, and that, you know, obviously is exactly what I do every single day. When yeah. I'm tasting wine. I'm all constantly looking at, you know, quality factors and saying, you know, okay, this, this is of a style. The style and quality are two very different things. Describe the style for people so that you're managing their expectations when they're reading their ta the tasting notes. They know exactly what they're going to get if they buy that same wine, but also to say where it sits qualitatively um, uh, next to its peers within that style group. So um, what then led you from all these different areas into wine writing in particular? And um, I mean, that was, was that meeting Parker himself meeting Bob or was there something else that started that? Yeah, I guess. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of almost uh, weird, you know, the way that, that, you know, obviously I started out writing and now yeah. I circle, circle back yeah. to writing <laughs> um, and it's a different type of writing, but it's, you know, it's for, for me, what I do now, as we were talking about earlier, is, is very much storytelling, mm -hmm. which, you know, I love doing um, as well as, as being, you know, a hardcore critic as well. Um, with the, the tasting notes and the ratings. Um, but uh, the writing part, you know, it, it, it really kind of came about, yes, I guess when I met Robert Parker, which was in Japan of all places, you know, I happened to be um, uh, working uh, in Japan. I was uh, a, as a wine buyer for an importer and an educator. And um, he was coming to Japan and I was asked to help um, uh, organize some of the wines for the, the tastings that he was gonna be presenting um, and the sourcing of the wines, but also recommending what we could get, you know, with him and working with him um, to put together those wine lists um, for the events that he would be doing. 
um, and then to accompany him and, and to help him out. And, you know, I was terrified at first. I was like, oh my God, he's going to be like, you know, all these, these British critics that I've met on steroids or something, you know, it's just like, you know, there, there's a certain amount of egos, let's just say that comes with, with our, our, our profession. Yes. <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Um, but, you know, when I met him, I couldn't, believe what a breath of fresh air or he is I should say he is because he's just the most humble you know um, gracious person on the planet and you know uh, so interested in in my thoughts and my opinions on things as well and you know oftentimes he would you know ask me to come up on the um, on the podium with him and speak about wines as well um, uh, so just just always very interested in hearing what other people had to say, not always about him. And, and one of his favorites and, and something that he lived by was, you know, the best palette is your own, the consumer's palette, the person who's buying the wine, that, that's the best palette and he's working for you. And that, that's there always been my view as well. I'm, I'm not, you know, writing for myself. I'm not trying to get consumers to like the wines that I like what would be the point of that? I'm trying to help you find the wines that you want. And I'm trying to describe those accurately and say qualitatively where they sit. And that, that's, that's my job. <laughs> you know, it's not, not to, to get up on a pedestal and, and tell you what you should drink and what you shouldn't. So certainly not to gloss over because it, it was 13 years of your life there at the Wine Advocate. But I mean, you were both writer and then you ended up becoming the senior editor in chief and were more involved. I mean, you still reviewed wines at the time and wrote, but um, I'm sure there was more running of the overall business, that kind of thing at that time. Did that, I mean, and now you've started your own publication. Did that lead to you wanting to start your own publication or did it, was it actually a deterrent yeah. sometimes and say, oh my God, I don't want to deal with all the crap. Well, yes and no. I mean, because, you know, running a business is, is actually, you know, a lot of fun mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a lot of work, as you know, yes. <laughs> yes. a lot of work, a lot more work than being an employee. Um, but that said, you know, there were, there were obviously, you know, I was not, uh, an owner or a shareholder um, in the wine advocate. Um, and, you know, therefore I had no say in, you know, how things would be run. Also, you know, when Michelin took over the company, we became part of a very large group. And, you know, this is no disrespect to Michelin, but they're, they're a mammoth company, mm -hmm. a multi-billion dollar company that, you know, is mainly about tires and a little bit of it is about experiences. Um, and so you're working for a big corporation with expectations and systems of working and reporting, you know, manners and all of this. And so it, it, it becomes almost like, you know, uh, a little bit unwieldy sometimes. And you think, you know, is, is this what I signed up to do? <laughs> sure. um, and uh, it, it was refreshing to be able to come back and, and manage with, with Johan um, and my par business partner, um, a company where you're doing, you know, exactly what you want and what you know is right, um, and not all of this other stuff. Um, and so you're you're not, you know, concerned with all of these other, you know, corporate considerations and all of that. Um, it's just, you know, about the core, getting back to the basics and the core of what you know you you want to do and how you can do it better. I mean, so the other. Slightly frustrating thing I should say about the wine advocate is that it's it's because it it has a history and it has a, a template almost. Mm -hmm. You're almost limited with what you can do, you know, you know, and so being able to start something new and something fresh gives you a certain sense of creative freedom. And I think you can very much see that with the wine independent, you know, with the visual storytelling, but also the storytelling. And we were talking about this um, uh, before we went went live is as you can see that the way that we construct the stories is a little bit different from maybe traditional wine criticism you know where you've got a report a brief report it can be you know maybe a little bit dry um, um, and then you know tasting notes um, whereas we're more about you know storytelling about an individual winery or a winemaker person and 
uh, honing in just on, on, you know, something so it's not a big, just, you know, a fun facet of, of this uh, winery story and some tasting notes to go with it. Um, and sometimes those are, you know, uh, vertical going back to older vintages that help, you know, back up the story. Or sometimes it's about new releases um, so that, you know, people can actually go out and, and buy some of those wines in the market. Well, and it does seem like wine publications have gotten to the point that they tend to be much heavier one or the other. Like, okay, I've got my list of 700 Bordeaux's and then you see a list of 500 California Cabernets and then, you know, here's the yeah. Central Coast and it's one wine note after the other, after the other. And um and many wines today are very well made. So there's one really good score after another really good score after another really good score. <laughs> and, and it's hard to differentiate between those. So first off, I do think where you are writing, some, and then you have other people that write stories and they do it really well. I mentioned earlier to you before they come on, like Dave McIntyre from the Washington Post writes great stories. There are people that write Absolutely. wonderful stories about wines. Actually, Aaron Minnenberg, who's on here, write some wonderful stories uh, as well on Good Venice. Um, uh, there are um, people who do that. You've got a kind of a combination of the two where you have stories, maybe you pull out someone from the, the reviews to spotlight and tell a story about them. And, and I think that's really interesting and really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we do the, the big reports as well. I mean, I had to do the 2021 um, Bordeaux en Primeur for example, where you, you've got lots of tasty notes and you have to do a very structured, you know, methodical, uh, well-researched report on the vintage uh, as well. So we do have those too, but just breaking those up as well so that in between, you know, every week we want to publish at least two um, stories and some of them are very short. Um, and, and as you've seen, we've just launched um, a, um, a photojournalist section mm -hmm. of the website that's free to view the sepage section, which is mostly just photography um, yeah. with a few little captions and, and, and words to sort of take you through what's going on here, but it's just beautiful photography. Well, um, it's so, a different way of telling a story too, though, honestly. Yeah, is exactly. Through, yeah. Exactly. And, and, you know, that for me, it doesn't always have to be about the tasting notes. This one on the new... Um, Catayard Vineyard in, in Napa, for example, you know, they haven't released anything yet. Um, and, and so, but I wanted to do a story on that. And so, you know, we brought a photographer in and we've got a lot of images there and just talking about what they're doing and how they're, they're making some changes there in the new winery and all of that. So, you know, some, some stories that, that I feel need to be told and that, that wine consumers want to hear about um, don't really have any tasting notes to go with them. Um, the other one we, we, we've got um, taken in R.H. Drexel, who's, who's writing stories for us as well that have no tasting notes attached. So she yeah. did a, a beautiful one on, on Realm recently, um, which is you know, just a, a story basically. And it's, it's just wonderfully told. Um, so, and I want to get more and more voices on the site as well, because I think it's important. I was going to ask you about that in a minute, but we did have a question from the audience. You know, it does seem like um, certain publications historically, certainly the, the advocate was this way. You knew, okay, the California cab, big cab issue is December. The, the, I mean, there were certain time periods and certain large reports came out. When y'all were setting up the Wine Independent, did you consider different formats, different ways of doing it and come to a decision, this is how it was going to be. Um, how, how did you make that decision? Yeah, I, very much so. I mean, I used to um, work on the editorial calendar for the, the Wine Advocate um, and put that all together. I was like, heard and cats. <laughs> um, but uh, we, and I've just put one together. We're going to we're going to um, uh, uh, put it on the website very soon, actually, because I've done um, an annual um, editorial calendar for the Wine Independent. So because now that we've got Susan on board, um, doing Italy, and we'll probably be bringing some more people in next year. We've got a much clearer picture um, uh, throughout the year of when the major reports will be coming out. Um, so that that will be in the pipeline, so that people can expect, um, you know, the regular reporting that you you get with any wine publication, um, including the the big Napa report. So I've just you know been um, booking my visits and tastings and all of that. 
Sure. Um, so yes, I mean, it will work a little bit conventionally like that because you know you, you have to cover wines that will be of interest to people um, who are, are collecting wines. Uh, you have to, to cover all of those new releases and things like that so that they know where to, to spend their money. Um, but a lot of what we do is also just, you know, highlighting and spotlighting um, producers that maybe are under the radar or new that, that people haven't heard of before. Well, um, so there are so two that, producers I've purchased because of your recommendations. Um, Chateau Jean Foray, Cabernet Franc, uh, producer in, from Bordeaux. And those wines the, are great. And, I love them. And then the Walson Holland stuff that you just recently wrote about, a new producer. Oh, cool down in Ojai area <laughs> but but I mean I think it's difficult like if you are a publication sometimes to say who do I um you know what new wines do I take in how do you discover these because I mean you know what what is new and interesting how do you settle on somebody I mean is it do you hear from somebody I mean obviously you've got connections in the business and you hear somebody you trust say hey you really should try this wine or Absolutely. How does that go about? Absolutely. You know what? I, I'm a, a total, I, I um, go through all of the social media sites as well. I mean, I just, I'm always lurking in the background. I follow um, real people, collectors, just, just people who like to talk about wine. I read all the bulletin boards uh, and I'm constantly looking for tips, you know, of, apart from my group, but, you know, a person's group can be limited. You, you need to have further reach. And that's why I love social media. I am such a stalker. <laughs> I stalk out all these people on social media going, oh, ooh, that sounds really good. Um, and I got to tell you, because we haven't announced this report that, that's coming out next week yet. So this is an exclusive for you. Um, next, week, um, <laughs> next week, I'm featuring a report that I did on grower champagnes. Um, which takes me back to my, my, my champagne years. But it's something that I wanted to do. Um, because I love the a lot of the new grower champagnes that are coming out, um, and but you know we're all looking for value. You know we're all looking for value when it comes to champagne. What what should you buy? What's what's boring? What's really great? You know what what should you be looking out for? Um, and so what we what I did was because at Johan and I we really wanted to get a champagne and report in before the end of the year, um, but we didn't have time to go to champagne. We will go next year. Um, I said, well, why don't I just buy the wines? You know, we'll, we'll buy 50 grower champagnes, you know, that I've got really good tips off on, or I know, and I'll taste them blind. And, you know, they'll, we'll call it, you know, 50 grower champagnes under $100. That was the, the price limit for each of them um, that I tasted blind. Um, and the results are so interesting. I found so many great grower champagnes for under $100 that put some of the, you know, brown marks that cost two, three, four times more to shame. And I did put some ringers in the brown marks as well, um, the prestige, prestige from the grand marks. So, I mean, and that was just such a fun thing to do, but mainly I did it because it was the kind of report I would want to read. You know, sure. particularly at this time of the year, you're thinking, oh, you know, I really want to, to get some champagne in, you know, I don't want it to cost a fortune because some of these grower champagnes, I mean, the Egliori, I know, oh my God, yeah. you know, they're getting to be so pricey and, you know, good luck finding sell-offs. Um, but, you know, so who are these, these, you know, great little grower champagnes out there that still aren't crazy prices? Um, and that's what I wanted to know because I wanted to stock up. <laughs> <laughs> for the, the holiday season. So it's, well, you've it's, already it's had sort three people say they funny. can't wait to read that report. So <laughs> obviously <laughs> um, there's a lot of interest in that. Yeah I, yeah, I have a soft spot in my heart for Ulysse Colin, but the prices have gotten um, just off the chart. I know, I know. And so, you know, I, and but I think that there's a real gap out there. I mean, who's, who's talking about this? You know, uh, of course you get like people covering champagne who are talking about, all of these, you know, great growers and that you can't afford anymore. Well, thanks a lot, yeah. you know, <laughs> but you know, tell me something I don't know. Tell me about, you know, who should I be buying, who I can afford right now? You know, that that's what I want to read. And so that was the report I wrote. <laughs> so that's, yeah, I'm just finishing that off and that will but, be- um, But that's great that you time. hear, I mean, time on social media and is that from friends and other things that you hear um, about these wines from other people, people that are just drinkers out there, but you have enough, interest behind it, it it's 
I, I think and that's then, a great. You know, we we had the money in the budget, you know, to to go out and buy the champagne, you know, to actually buy them, and then taste them blind, you know, so that you know you're, you're actually kind of putting your money where your mouth is. And there's something about that as well. I mean, it's it's our our hard-earned cash that we're putting into these champagnes, you know. And you think like a consumer. I feel angry when I think I just spent seventy-five bucks on this champagne, yeah. and yeah. it's just terrible terrible or, or likewise you know i spent 75 bucks on this champagne and wow it's mind-blowing you know i'm gonna <laughs> buy all i can find <laughs> yeah you know, so so that's it you know it's it's really putting yourself in the the seat of the consumer and and you know writing on behalf of them you know what when you're 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 ripped off and you're angry you know that needs to go in the tasting note when when you know it, the wine is just like mind-blowing and you, you can't get enough of it, that needs to go in the tasting note too. Um, so it's it's that, you know, it's it's really getting back to, you know, writing for consumers. Okay. So when, when you started the Wine Independent, um, there was a little bit of a, a, a hoopla made where you talked about, hey, it's time to return to independent wine journalism. I mean, I got the press release and all of that. Um, but I guess, I don't think the average person necessarily knows I mean, they they think if uh, you know if I gave you a hundred dollars and you gave me a ninety five because I gave you a hundred dollars, they would see that as being a clear conflict. But there are other levels of conflicts with wineries that could pay to be in tastings or uh, other things that can be really um, or early release notes perhaps or other things that that are um, real questionable potential practices mm -hmm. out there, and so. Um, when you are on your site and all that, where you define really what independence means or what it means to you all, can you kind of explain to people what, what it is, shorthand at least? Well, you know, I think it's, it's really, you know, what I just said, it's, it's working on behalf of the consumer and, and full stop, you know, you, you um, in no way um, have any agendas when it comes to wine because you receive nothing from them. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, it, it's, it's about, for me, you know, I, I really, you know, it, I think nothing and I don't care if wineries even, you know, um, uh, sign up and, and, you know, what I get really excited about is when consumers are, are uh, subscribers, because for me, that's, that's what really drives a wine publication, you know, that, that's a super, Consumers believe what you're saying, they trust you, and they are have some faith in your recommendations. And that that's, you know, who we're working for. Um, whenever, you know, that there's other things going on behind the scenes, and, you know, it, I, I don't want to do any finger pointing or anything no. like that, but, you know, it, whether it's events, as you mentioned, you know, and you're receiving a large amount of money from wineries, for them to, you know, come and, and show wines at your events, or whether it's, you know, sponsorship in, in a magazine, or, you know, whether it's, you know, being able to have access to the, the tasting notes and scores before everybody else, all of these things, you know, that that's anti-consumer, that's working against the consumer. Um, and, and that's what we need to get back to is just working for the consumer, being completely unbiased. Um, having no agendas, you know, not mattering, you know, whether it's a, a Grand Cru Class A that is $600 or, you know, it's a, you know, a, a $60 bottle of wine um, that's actually, you know, over delivering, you know, these, these two, you know, can in theory get the same score if their, their quality mm -hmm. matches. Um, and, and that's what the whole point needs to be, um, that we're not dis persuaded by anything. Um, and I know, you know, that, that sometimes it's, um, you know, better to, to do blind tastings. I, I had fun doing blind tastings for this last set of champagnes. Sometimes it's just not necessary or if it's, it's not beneficial. So it's not just about doing blind tastings either. You know, it's, it's really about, you know, um, having, having absolutely no agendas behind the scenes. And, you know, we didn't really want to bang on too much about it. We just thought, okay, we'll just put it in the name sure. <laughs> and leave it at that, you know, that, that, that 
that is our core, you know, and that, that that's where we start. And then we want to provide so much more because it's so much of what we're doing is different from everybody else. Um, and we, we hope that people appreciate that or, or can see that um, as well. Well, I think one great example was you were fairly straightforward and fairly frank about the like 2021 Bordeaux vintage. Um, and um, I think your notes and scores reflected that. I, I saw more scores in the 80s and even some in the 70s than uh, I've seen yeah. in some time. And, yeah. and with some real names too, in, in some cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were a lot of angry people. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, it, the, the thing is, I wasn't trying to even make a point. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, it, it, nobody, nobody likes to give a good, a bad review. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not fun. But again, you know, if I were a consumer and I'm reading a glowing review with a, you know, good score on a wine that's disappointing, I'm angry you know, when I buy that wine and I'm disappointed. Um, and so I have to always think like a consumer. And so when I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the wines of 2021 and I'm tasting them and they're really not measuring up, particularly given, you know, the recent vintages mm -hmm. that Bordeaux has had, which are, are great, you know, the 2018, 2019, 2020, all three really good vintages, very different styles, but very good vintages. And then, you know, when you're, you're, you know, looking at, at some of the other scores out there and you're saying, oh, you know, this, this, there's actually, you know, not much difference between the scores. Sometimes they're the same, yeah. you know, as those great vintages. And I'm tasting the ones and I know that they're, you know, in some cases lean green and mean or dilute, you know, and just plain disappointing. Um, even, you know, a lot of the, the top, top names in Bordeaux well, you've got to say that you've got to tell people, uh, it, you know, it's, and you can't ever think, okay, well, what's the winery going to think of me if I say this? Sure. You so I, I was going to ask that, does that ever cross? I mean, or is there any concern, you know, okay, I'm not going to be welcome back at this place. And how, how does that? Nope. Nope. No, 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 yeah, just no, sure. it, it never ever crosses my mind because it's it's not a consideration you know obviously they have every right to throw me out i i i went straight back to bordeaux in june i was doing um uh, uh well i'm going to start uh, rolling out um, a series of verticals on 2015 2016 2017 um, and 2018 vintages um so we're um, i'm looking at each one of those um uh, and then we've got over 200 notes for each of those vintages of all the top lines so i had to walk in to each of the one of those wineries sure. right after that report came out and face those winemakers. And you have to do that. You have to. But you know, I, I do it with pride because you know I stand behind the reviews that I'm writing. And you know, I I write them with absolute honesty. Um, and you know, if that's that's the way I saw the wine, then that's it. You know, that there's it is what it is. So given um, the for, stylist... for them. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was no, going to say I, for them, actually, in, in a lot of cases, it wasn't, you know, just, it wasn't poor winemaking or anything like that. I mean, occasionally that, that is what happens, you know, somebody really screws it up. Um, but, you know, in, in that case, it, it was, it was a real, you know, awful vintage. I mean, everything, they, they got hit by everything. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, kind of understandable for them to, you know, they know where their wine sits in context. What they don't like is somebody calling it out. <laughs> sure. So given the stylistic diversity in the wine world right now, is it hard for you at all to differentiate between, okay, this is just a different style versus the quality isn't as high? I mean, how is that a challenge in some ways? That's a really good question um, because I think, you know, that that's what sort of separates the experienced experts from the rookies because, you have to understand, you know, what the valid styles are and what's the difference between something that's elegant, perfume, pretty, and, you know, but has great intensity and length and all of those things versus something that's just underripe and um, hollow in the middle and it has a limited amount of aroma and flavor compounds because they weren't uh, allowed to evolve um, on the vine. 
so you know understanding those differences and and likewise you know for a riper style when when you know this is a, a signature of, of of vintage and somebody you know managed to get it just right they've got all of those fully evolved aromas and flavor compounds really beautifully ripe tannins in there um, and the fruit hasn't gone overblown basically so you know understanding you know at, at both ends of those those ripeness spectrums that you know, ripeness doesn't exist in a, a single point on a graph. Right. It's it's a it's a band, um, right. and sometimes you know, given the vintage or the grape variety, that band might be narrower. Uh, sometimes it's broader. You know, with, with some grapes are more forgiving. Um, you know, with that that ripeness band, Cabernet can be more forgiving. Um, Syrah or Shiraz can certainly be more forgiving. Chardonnay, but then you get other grape varieties like Pinot Noir, um, which are a lot less forgiving. Yeah, <laughs> they kind of do have to get it right, just right. Um, so, but, but yes, I mean, that, that is absolutely it, you know, as a critic understanding what is, you know, a style, you know, that, that, you know, is, is, you know, all singing, all dancing and, and, you know, it really, they just nailed it. You know, I mean, it's, it's got all of that complexity that it's looking for it's beautifully right tenants. It's wonderfully balanced, you know, it's, it's got everything that you're looking for, uh, versus something that is overripe or underripe. Um, sure. So, uh, and, so and you know, knowing what that is. One question that ties into this, but one also I, I did want to mention, you have, I mean, along this line of different styles, um, it, and you can, I, I, I would encourage you to mention this as well, because you have a, a really interesting search engine that you've put up so that people can look up different words or different descriptors, uh, different things that will um, help guide them to certain wine types in some ways that fit their palate perhaps more than something else does. Yeah, well, it doesn't exactly work like that, but we have put in more filters. You're absolutely right, right. so that people can hone in on the styles of wines they want. So um, two of the ones that were very important to me because they do very much speak to the style of the wine and therefore what kind of experience that you're looking for as a consumer are the alcohol level um, which I know can be a little bit misleading because mm -hmm. people don't ever almost put the exact alcohol in the back. No, of the come on. <laughs> <laughs> There's some wiggle room there. If, if I have the technical information, I'll put the technical one in. Um, but otherwise, we're at least giving the experience that somebody has when they pick up a bottle and they look at it and they're reading the alcohol level mm -hmm. on it. So you can um, filter by alcohol level. Um, and we've got like a little uh, neat little sort of sliding bar basically if you only want to look at wines that say under 14 percent alcohol you can do that or you can um you know look at wines that are, are likewise uh, over 14 percent alcohol so um you, you can search by that but also by body and i've been very clear on how body is defined so obviously body is largely made up by alcohol um the higher the alcohol is the more um, body something will have, um, but also um, by factors like residual sugar. Uh, if it's very sweet wine, obviously it can be fuller bodied. Um, things like tannins and anthocyanins, dry extract, can give a sense of weight on the palate as well. Um, so, uh, for example, we've taken on another critic, Susan Hume, um, who's also a master of wine, to do Italy. And we had a long conversation so that we're both on exactly the same page about um, the, the different levels of uh, body and how we um, professionally assess those and we can put each wine into one of those categories. So every single wine that we review um, has a, a body level assigned to it. Um, we've got five levels, light, light to medium, medium, medium to full and full bodied. Um, so that if somebody knows that they're looking, they only want a full bodied wine on this occasion, um, then they can only search for full bodied or maybe medium to full and full bodied. Likewise, if somebody only wants lighter bodied wines or light to medium bodied wines, then they can filter by that as well. Um, the other major difference that we have with the style filters is grape variety. Now on the Wine Advocates website and everybody else who's copied the Wine Advocate website, a lot of the wines are just down as blends. Um, so it's a Bordeaux blend or it's a Champagne blend or it's a Rome blend, um, but it doesn't tell you specifically what the major grape variety in, in um, the wine is. For every single wine that we review, you have to put in what the major grape is. 
So for example, if you're looking at Bordeaux 2020 or 2021, and you know you only want to search for Cabernet Franc based wines, you can do that on our website where you can't do that on other people's websites. And that impacts the style a lot. You know, for example, I know, you know, what I like, I love Cabernet Franc wines as well. Right. I, and, uh, you know, I'm a geek about that. I love searching to see, you know, which Cabernet Franc wines, you know, can I get from, you know, from this vintage? Um, and it, it varies from vintage to vintage. Some some wineries, you know, or, you know, some vintages of Palmer, it's more Merlot than it is Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and you'd be surprised how many wines in the Medoc are mainly Merlot when, you know, people think, think of Cabernet Sauvignon for the Medoc. So um, that's the other in interesting um, style tool that we have on the website. And we have all of the other filters that you have on the other websites too. But um, just those ones help you to hone in just a little bit more on the style of wine that you're looking for before you even have to look at the scores. Um, and I think that just makes people's choices a little bit easier. I also work very hard on my tasting notes as well um, to, to describe as accurately as, as consistently as possible, the style of the wine, so that you know you can you can know what to expect when you purchase that wine as well. So someone was asking about how you are approaching the 2020 vintage in California with smoke issues potentially in certain wines and not. Um, how have you gone about dealing with that in particular? Um, and and the, the concerns about wines just. I mean, wineries, some wineries are putting things out, other wineries are choosing mm -hmm. not to. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you, what, how are you looking at it? Yeah, it's a toughie 2020 vintage in um, Northern California. It's, it's, a, it's a real heartbreaker, it is. Um, I already put out on the website um, a little um, preliminary article about smoke taint in uh, Northern California in 2020. Um, yeah, there's a lot of wines that are impacted with that the ones even um, that, that um, decided to, to put out. Um, there's a few that I've tasted that managed to get away with it. You know, and um, uh, there was an Aperture wine um, that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago, um, which is a 2020 Cabernet blend um, from various different pockets in Sonoma um, that uh, Jesse Katz managed to put together. And it, it is really impressive. Um, so, you know, I, th I think the not all wines from the 2020, or I should say red wines. I haven't found any whites from the 2020 vintage that were smoke tainted, um, which is probably because the fire is so late in the season and people don't really, um, uh, there's no skin contact really with yeah. white wines. So it was really only impacting the skins. Had the smoke come earlier than the season when what you might've got was the um, taint actually going into the, the flesh of the berry. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe we would have seen some issues, but I haven't seen any smoke tainted white wines and some lovely 2020 white wines um, from Northern California. So, so far, touch wood, so far so good on the white wines. Um, I've tasted some good Pinots um, yeah. from 2020. I've tasted some smoke tainted Pinots from 2020 as well. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, so it really depends on when the fruit was brought in and where it was hanging um, at the time of those fires. Um, and then we get to the Bordeaux varieties where it becomes a much more difficult story. And, and I should say it's not just Sonoma and, and Napa. It goes all the way down to Paso Robles. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, I think anywhere, you know, when, when you're, you're, you're kind of south of there, um, down to Santa Barbara County, I haven't had any smoke tainted 2020s down in, from Santa Barbara County yet. Um, but where, as you're moving north, and you're getting to those um, later ripening um, red varieties, then yeah, we, we've got real problems out there. And I would use extreme caution um, buying any of those wines because one of the issues, and I saw this with the 2017s that I was reviewing, and I, I, I was the first one to call out smoke tainted wines that I saw. Um, same with you know some of the smoke tainted wines that were coming out from Howell Mountain and Atlas Peak and some other areas in 2018. Yeah. Um, um, you know, as soon as I see it, you know, again, um, I'm, I will call it out. I will say, you know, I, I believe this wine is smoke tainted. Um, but um, even if I don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not smoke tainted. Mm -hmm. And that that's one of the insidious things about smoke taint, because it can, you know, it lurk as a, as a precursor um, to come out uh, later on once it's, it's separated from its, its glycoside bond. 
Um, so um, even if you know what you're reading a review from me, you know from a, a wine that was potentially impacted by smoke taint, and it, I'm saying it's not smoke taint, doesn't mean it's not. Um, so it's it's a it's a big concern. Um, and, and, you know, that's all, that I would just proceed with caution. I'm not saying don't buy any because, you know, there's probably some beautiful wines out there. Um, uh, I, what I would recommend that is if you do buy them, probably drink them more in the short term than the longer term um, because we, we don't know. And, and as I was um, uh, alluding to before, with some of the 17s that I tasted um, and I didn't find smoke taint, um, I would taste those a few years later and go, oh, damn, that wine does have smoke taint. Um, so it can show itself, you know, years later. So getting really dweeby, how do you approach Britannomyosin in the same way? Or are you okay with that? Because Brett can bloom in the bottle and change the wine dramatically. It can, yeah. You know, um, I, I, I have my terms that I use, you know, the sweaty leather, leather. I always use that term. If you ever see that in my tasting note, that means it's got a bit of breath. Um, okay. Anything that's really bready, obviously I'd call it out. You rarely see wines that are so, so bready that you're like, oh God, um, unless it's an older wine, an uh, older vintage, you know, sure. oftentimes you, you do um, catch those uh, real, real sort of, you know, breads overtaken, you know, and usually that will have been, you know, and a lot of times that is bottle variation as well, because yes, there was a, it was bottle and filter and there was a bloom that just overtook the bottle and boom, you've got, you know, this, this bready mess. Um, but I, I usually, if I see just a little bit of it, I'll, I'll put a, a descriptor in there about the, the breadiness um, that, you know, it's kind of unmistakable, like sweaty leather or sweaty saddles. Sure. Me is the, the classic one. What else? What else could that be? Yes. <laughs> um, um, but uh, um, uh, if it's if it's too bready, you know, and particularly if it's like an older wine or you know the bloom's taken over in the bottle, yeah, I'll, I'll call it out. Um, but you know, likewise, it could just be bottle variation in those cases too. Um, so it's, well, it's not. And I think that's one of the harder things that these days we want wine. We almost want wine that has less done to it from a wine making point of view, consumers, people sometimes are really interested in wines that are made in a, a, a less invasive fashion. And yet they want the wine that they loved when they tasted it over in France to taste the same when it gets here to the United States and they bought it and kept it in their cellar. And th <laughs> those two things don't always work well together. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough, you know, particularly, you know, uh, you, you, you do want the, you know, unfiltered experience. You don't, you don't want lots of SO2 added. You want, you know, things to be as, as natural and as bright and as expressive as possible. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it, it comes at a cost sometimes. Um, and so these things are, are obviously to be expected. To be, uh, to be honest, though, I mean, you know, apart from, you know, as somebody who's you know really going the the you know uber natural route or something like that um most of the wineries know how to control Britannomyces in the the winery um and they're very careful when they're bottling and you know you rarely get you know something that's so horrible nowadays um, sure you almost jump, jump up and down with excitement when you do see it you're like oh <laughs> um, but you know, yeah, you, you don't see it so much. You know, um, uh, wine faults like that, which you know are almost unforgivable now, because they, there's so many you know good means of of being able to manage these things in the winery, um, just through you know basic hygiene. Um, so we're, we're getting near the end. Two questions I had, and the, the first one is: Have you ever? I mean, you've done so many different things in the wine business. Have you ever made wine or considered playing with a small amount of wine? If you haven't, or uh, not for myself, no, no. But I've, I've you know, done some, uh, you know, punching down and harvest sure. and things like that in wineries. And when I was living in Japan, actually, I was working with um, uh, Denny Du Bourdieu um, from Bordeaux University. Um, to uh, help make better quality koshu wine. So I did um, some winemaking at um, uh, Japanese wineries with koshu. In fact, that was my master of wine dissertation. And I'm one of the, the world's foremost experts on the koshu grape. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, I mean, I, I've made a, uh, worked in a little bit in wineries. And you know, honestly, I, I won't claim to have been a winemaker. 
no, sure. no. I've just been a cellar rat really before <laughs> um, and, and done a bit of that um, uh, just to understand the concepts behind winemaking a bit better, I guess. Um, and that, that was mainly when I was doing my MW as well, so that I, I really had a good grasp on um, the technical side. So um, you also mentioned that you've hired a wine writer, um, Susan, who's covering um, Italy, and it seems like um, that there could be more areas. I mean, you can only do so much yourself and all that. Well, what, when you started the Wine Independent, and I don't know if this has changed because you're fairly new, but what do you look at at the, the end? What makes a successful wine publication? I mean, you hope to make some money at this, I assume. You don't want this to be a, a nonprofit uh, thing. <laughs> no, it's not a charity either. <laughs> yeah. So, what makes it successful? I mean, in the end, what, what do you judge? you know, at some point in time say, hey, this really went well. What, where are you going to be? It's a good question. You know, our, our expectations are actually very modest. Um, and I should say the expectations of our shareholders. Um, who we've got a, a group of shareholders in, based in Sweden. Um, so we've got 11 shareholders um, who have a minority stake in the, the company. Um, but None of them are involved in the wine industry at all. That was the one um, uh, big stipulation um, uh, when they came on board. Um, and for them, it's 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 largely a, a lifestyle thing as well. We we do you know wine tastings and dinners and things like that with them. Um, so we're we're you know a fun tight knit group um, as well. Um, so their their expectations are modest, and that was something that we had to be very honest with ourselves and with them about from the beginning. Um, going back to what I was saying, I've worked in just about every job in the wine industry. I know the numbers. <laughs> I know that there's only so much that you can expect to make out of uh, 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 a business like this. Um, that said, I think that you can make, you know, a comfortable living as well without, you know, um, uh, selling your soul at all. You don't, you know, need to, you uh, go down all of these paths that could compromise your integrity. Um, I think that there's still room out there for a pure uh, subscription model like we've got. Um, and, you know, we, we keep our, our overheads down. You know, we don't, we don't have any fancy offices or anything. Okay. You can see them in my basement. <laughs> we don't. Um, we pay our own way. But, you know, as I was saying to you before, we don't stay in luxury hotels and staying at the Novo Hotel in Bordeaux. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, this is very much the way Bob did it. You know, uh, you, we just stick to the core of the business and we, we um, you know, don't really go off that. Um, that said, I do think that there is um, there's a, a big demand out there for real, honest information, um, for ways of um, navigating databases like we're doing, um, for taking the experience of a wine publication to another level um, visually and with storytelling um, that we're doing. Um, so I think that you know, we can appeal to a broader audience eventually. Um, but you know, we have to be patient as well. You know, the, the, and this is something that we very much plan for in our business planning. You know, these things don't happen overnight. People don't discover you overnight. And also, you know, our, build, our database is building up, um, you know, so that, that there's more and more for people to actually search. And that's when the filters start to really make sense when you can search a vast database of, of Bordeaux vintages. One of the reasons why we're doing all of the retrospective mm -hmm. tastings that we're doing. And then, you know, it gets really fun to be able to make these discoveries about the Cabernet Franc based wines or the amount of wines in 2018 that were below 14% alcohol, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is a very warm, ripe vintage. Um, so all of these things, you know, you can play around with and, and find and discover, um, um, which you can't do on other websites. So um, I did post here that, that you and Johan have been very kind provide a, a code that provides a small discount if people are members. So take a look at that over in the chat function. Um, I, I find it fantastic that you figured out a career in wine actually makes potentially more money than a playwright. You know, you, there, there, aren't, there aren't many things that you can look at and say, boy, wine is more lucrative than, but perhaps playwright was one of them. So it's true. Yeah. Right. Well, 
um, I, I want to thank you. If any of y'all joined late, I'm going to post this on my YouTube channel as well. But Lisa, I, I do really like, really love, quite frankly, the publication, the combination of, okay. of ratings and the storytelling. And uh, having had something that has provided me with, with two new things for my seller that I don't need, honestly. In that, the that makes my day. I mean, yeah. when I hear that, I'm like, yes, it's working. <laughs> it is. It is. It's pretty fantastic. So thank you for being here. Um, cheers to you. Take care. Thanks. Bye, everybody.